there is a place suspended between the sea and the sky where fish have four eyes. An enchanted place where trees and waves do battle, pulling new land from the tide. A place forever changed by clearing, cultivation, and concrete. Slowly being lost to the same forces that shaped it and made it fertile. But what if I told you that there is a secret power hidden in these waves? Over 250 million tons of liquid land birthed by the Amazon and captured by mangroves. For ours is the muddiest coast in the world, a natural earth engine powered by sun and sea, generating fish, food, and flood protection. We can harness this engine by combining natural elements and man-made structures. Putting nature to work as we rebuild a resilient coast. A place to imagine, plan and design with nature in mind. Guyana is that place and now is the time. Growing up in Georgetown for me was always so wonderful because there was this mix of cultures. It's South American, but it's not South American. It's Caribbean, but it's not Caribbean. It's a real fusion mix of everything, which is so wonderful. Guyanese culture is very wide. We have the, the Indians, the Africans, Chinese, the Portuguese, the Amerindians who were here before. To me, I feel very blessed to be able to have had that, that mix of culture growing up and be able to be a part of, of all of it. There are so many places to go and see in Ghana. We have some very beautiful landmarks. We have them here in Georgetown. Of course, you have the St. George's Cathedral. You have the um, Supreme Court. Of course, we have Castellani House. And all those buildings have so much history to them. Something that we have that is totally and individually a Guyanese thing. It's not an Indian, it's not an African, it's not a Chinese or a Portuguese or Amerindian. And this is especially seen in the food um, that we eat. And Guyanese curry is not a really an Indian curry, it's different from an Indian curry. And the same with coco rice. We're really mixing, and that's the wonderful thing that is the Guyanese culture, is that mix of everything and everybody doing everything and accepting everything. I mean, a lot of people think that when you talk about culture, you're talking about it's music and dance, and they feel that's culture, but it's not. It's all what we do every day, the way we walk, the way we talk. That in itself is an attraction. Just in the way we see things and the way we do things and, and, and accepting each other's culture and one is not better than another, it's all equal. It's all part of who we are. It's 
a very personal and unique experience that is really found nowhere else. My name is Charlie Tokley. I am a traveller and a tourist. I live in Georgetown, however, I travel extensively whenever I get the opportunity to do so. I've travelled in various parts of the world and in Latin America in particular. For these last three years, I've been living and working on the coast and as often as possible getting off into Guyana's interior to see what the country has to offer. My most recent trip was to Region 9 to the Rupununi, so it was a savanna and, and rainforest trip. So when I first decided to do this trip, I knew that it wasn't a trip that I could do alone. Going to somewhere like the Rupununi, it's always a lot better if you know somebody that knows the area, that knows uh, the animals that you're going to be seeing or that you're going to try to be seeing. So I called up one of my good friends who himself is a naturalist, a birder, a photographer, kind of a jack of all trades and someone who knows the Rupununi inside out. I asked if he wanted to come with me as a friend and as a guide. Fortunately for me, he said yes, which set the scene for an amazing 10 days ahead. My name is Jonathan Negroot. I'm Guyanese, lived here all my life. I'm a freelance photographer. Do that in my spare time, spend a lot of time traveling to the Rupununi and just, just exploring Guyana. You can go on a holiday and you can sit on a beach or next to a pool. It's not really traveling. Travelers are drawn to places like the Rupununi because they know that what you get out of it is, is just a multiple of what you put into it. For me, ecotourism definitely is the future of Guyana's tourism. Guyana has a lot of adventure out there, so it's definitely for people wanting to explore and go to places that is seldom traveled. It's definitely what I grew up doing and I would love to see people sharing that. Welcome to Waikin Ranch. I am Francesca Pires. I'm the co-owner, along with my husband, of this wonderful place. Around the ranch, the wildlife we have spotted, um, we even get them in our crops. Numerous birds. We have counted over 200 bird species here. We spot anteaters regularly. We, in the early years, we even had an anteater run through our compound here. And we have frequent um, capybara families, <laughs> pods that visit us. We feel that we have protected um, the area. We're like, sort of like the wardens of the area. And it's turned into some really beneficial views, plenty birds, more wildlife, more numbers. 
And I think that's super, super positive and amazing for us. It's, a, it's, a, it's really a great accomplishment for us. The ecologists need to protect uh, the wildlife. The most eye-catching product which sets them apart in the tourism industry is wildlife, it's biodiversity, the landscapes. If the ecologists don't protect what they have, then there won't be tourism. And if they have tourism, then they can protect what they have. So it's the, the two things go hand in hand, tourism and conservation. In some ways, the lodges are like their own little network of protected areas. Um, in that sense, because they're huge areas of land. Wiking, for example. Wiking is a very big ranch. Um, and so it, they have to work very hard to make sure that there's not poaching or there's not other things going on. But at the same time, from the tourism standpoint, it's the only way they can be viable is if they protect those species. So without tourism, you know, there's no safety or safeguard for those species. Nature doesn't go to sleep at night. A whole new cast of characters come out when, when darkness falls. And photography doesn't end when the sun sets. At night, you get more of an intimate feel with the animals because it's your flashlight really corrals what you see. And you get the opportunity to get a lot closer to these animals. Even if it's animals that aren't nocturnal, you get to see them in a different light when they're roosting, when they're nesting. And then also you get to see all these other animals you don't see during the day that come out at night. So it's a whole new experience um, when the sun sets. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Dylan Lawrence, a manager for Cayman House and also a village council. Right now we are at Cayman House. Um, we are in the middle of the village and um, we are all surrounded by rivers. Wildlife that you can search, which is commonly on the river, is the Black Cayman. We, as a community, has a project as well. Um, it's called the Black Cayman Project. For the Cayman Project, uh, directly we would go and collect data, um, analyze those data. We have developed that package, the Cayman Capture Experience package, into a tourism activity where when we book uh, activity, then um, we have a chance of, of, of getting our data through those activities so the tourists would pay us to actually go and do the project. The Cayman Tagging experience is um, it's a lot of fun. It's also very eye-opening. I mean, for some people it might be quite a scary experience because it's, it's dark, it's the middle of the night, you're on a river, there's not many of you, you're in a small boat and there's big Caymans. So 
It has all the ingredients of a horror movie, but at the same time, it's a very eye-opening, enriching experience as well. I think it builds a lot of appreciation of Kaimans as um, very beautiful creatures. You get to see the patterns on, on their bodies, like it, they have these amazing black and white patterns, you know, on their underside and, you know, on their tails and these kind of things. Kaiman tagging is a way to monitor the amount of Kaimans in the river. Um, it's a way to conserve and protect and, and understand the Kaimans a lot more for the community to understand the reproduction trends, to understand the, um, the habits of the Kaimans, which are quite misunderstood um, creatures. One of the things which I really liked was the hummingbirds and the birds around the, the lodge in Cayman House, that if you sat outside for more than five minutes, you would see two or three hummingbirds come in and jump from hibiscus flower to hibiscus flower, and completely unfazed by anybody that's watching them, you could just kind of get up really close and witness these beautiful little birds dancing and drinking nectar. And that was just in the lodge itself. It wasn't even the, the animal product that most tourists would go there to see. It was just kind of part of the surroundings. It's, it's good to get people to work in the community and live in the community. So this idea came up with finding local crafters or local artists to do the things that they would normally do at home, but to develop that into a marketing process where we can sell what we have, things that grow naturally here. And with the cotton, most ladies or girls here, youths are forgetting how to spend cotton. So the idea come up with why can't we as, as, as villagers do something for our youths, do something for our women. That's, that is how comes we have the women involved in this cotton, uh, processing of the cotton then from the seed to the thread and from the thread to the product. We are making lampshades and teaching other youths how to, to, to make local hammocks. My name is Melanie McTurk and I'm the managing director here at Karanambo Lodge. So, so Karanambo is, is um, in the North Rupununi. It's actually what is called uh, North Central and we are one of the closest sites to the Rupununi River. 
to understand tourism, you have to understand the spirit of Karanambo, which is very much one that is connected to the land and the history of the Rupununi and an abiding respect and desire to preserve this area of the Rupununi. But within the Karanambo area, you actually have five different habitats. So we have um, true savanna. We have, because we are of our proximity to the Rupununi River, we have gallery forests and oxbow lakes. We have, um, between the two, we have the flood forests and the, um, what are called the bush islands. Actually within Karanambo itself, you have Three Mile Bush, which is the largest bush island. And what's important about it is it's a, a critical refuge between the Kanakus and the Pakaraima Mountains. So it's, it's one of the reasons that we have so many large animals here at Karanambo. It's a, it's a critical um, site for them to seek shelter and to reproduce. Traditionally, Karanambo is the home of, of the Anne MacTurk's Auto Rehabilitation Program. She was known as the Otter Lady and she built her reputation as someone who would rescue abandoned river otter pups or other types of neotropical river otters and raise them almost as pets but they would be wild animals but she would kind of form this amazing bond with them and you see the, all these pictures of her kind of swimming in the water with these, these river otters. So giant otters were at one point uh, on the brink of extinction in the Rupununi River due to overhunting and trapping. So tourism gave an opportunity not only for individuals to be able to see and appreciate these beautiful animals, but also provided the funding that allowed Karanambo to do the conservation work that it has done. So giant river otters can be found in a lot of waterways along Annam, but they are very elusive. They live in these in these family groups, but they can be very skittish when people are around, you just, you don't see them. Yet if you quietly sit there and you wait long enough and they get brave enough to come forward, they're actually a very noisy social bunch. The Rupununi has always been somewhere to go where you're kind of guaranteed to get that experience if you spend, you know, enough days in the river. I'm Erin Earle, and I'm actually from Northern Ireland, but I've been living in the Rupununi for about 10 years. 
Well, the reason I got into conservation work was through the SRCS. Because whenever I first arrived in the Rupununi, I lived in a little village called Shulanab. And um, I was teaching with my friend. And every weekend, what we would do is we would go into the forest behind uh, Shulanab and look for red siskins. At that time, they were starting their first red siskin conservation project. So that was my first meeting with the SRCS. We've started our new project, which is Giant Anteaters. I'm pretty excited about that. So Wichibai is a scenic destination to go to, but it's also one of the center points for SRCS, which is South Rupununi Conservation Society. And a lot of the work that they do um, happens through Wichibai. Um, one of the great things that they do is the Giant Anteater Project. And the Giant Anteater is always, a, it's always an attraction for people because it's such a peculiar animal in the way it looks, the way it moves and it, its behavior. I think for some years we've been looking around and realizing that we don't see giant anteaters as often as we saw them before. And actually giant anteaters are endangered everywhere that they exist in the wild, in the world, right? And that's only in this part of Northern South America that they are existing. But here in the Rupununi, we have a population of giant anteaters and they're not really under threat from the same things that anteaters in other parts of South America are in threat from. We don't have busy roads. They're not really hunted for meat so much. The export trade isn't a thriving trade for anteaters here, although we think it does exist. Um, so right now we have this population of giant anteaters, but we're worried that in the future, there'll be more pressure on giant anteaters from um, hunting for meat as the, your traditional sources of bush meat deplete, anteaters could be eaten more for meat. As roads get busier, if indeed we get um, better road links to Brazil or to Georgetown, there is quite a high likelihood that anteaters can be taken from the wild here and taken to the coast or taken to Brazil for illegal export. So what we said was we would like to try and find out how many anteaters there are in this area, find out what are the threats against them, and then work out what we were going to do so that before these animals are threatened in the Rupununi, they are protected. So you want to get in there before they're threatened. So the giant anteater has always been a favorite of mine growing up. Every time you saw a giant anteater in the Rupununi, it was something special. You'd always stop the truck and everybody would jump out. Everybody would, you know, try to catch a glimpse of it. They're, they're more common in the mornings. You'd see that more in the mornings. They're somewhat nocturnal animals as well. So they tend to forage, you know, in the evenings and, and when the day is cooler. One of the really special moments you can have with an anteater is when you see a mother anteater with a young one on its back. So for the first year or so of, a, of an anteater's life, they will piggyback on their mother's back. And the older they get, the more she will allow it to come down and forage with her. But it's always interesting to see this, this little baby, you know, just clung onto the mother's back as they go, you know, foraging through the savannah sometimes. When you rush up on them by accident, you just see this animal bolting through the savannah and, you know, there's this baby just holding on to the back of her.
Suramum offers the opportunity to go down river and go and camp out along the waterway. So you can stay in Suram itself at the Eco Lodge. But what we did on this trip is we took the opportunity to head. It's only about a, a 20 minute boat ride up river. And when you get there, it's a nice little camp that's already established, but you also get that kind of, you know, exploration of being out in the wilderness, not being close to any sort of civilization where it's, it's just you, your crew and, you, and your guides. In Surama, we, where we were camping out, we, we were about to go to bed and all of a sudden we got a call from, from one of the ladies in camp and they took us over to the kind of storage room and there was a Labaria just sat there chilling out on, on one of the beams. Uh, Labarias are one of the most feared snakes in the Amazon region. They're responsible for the, the most deaths out of any type of snake. Um, partly because they're so common and also partly because they're so well camouflaged. Um, so they're one of the snakes you don't want to step on at night when you're out on a, on, a, on a night walk. You expect when you get back to camp you're going to be okay, you're just going to get in your hammock and you go to sleep. You don't expect to have one of the Amazon's most deadly snakes only 20 meters away within your camp. So for me, even though I am more of a birder, I love snakes. For me, they're always misunderstood. Not only in Guyana, but worldwide, these animals tend to have a very negative reputation with them in that they're very dangerous. Any snake will kill you, that kind of thing. And what I found with my experience with wildlife, I take the time to, to really learn about these animals. And snakes, for the most part, like any other wildlife, is just trying to exist without being interfered with by people. With snakes, they're very mysterious because of the way they move. They don't have legs, so we see that slithering motion as kind of intimidating because we don't quite understand it. Whereas if you take the time to get to know these snakes, snakes play a very important role in our ecosystem as a predator and as a prey item. Guyana for me is unique in not only what it has to offer, but how it offers that. It's a breath of fresh air with all the development going on and to still have somewhere to escape and be one with nature. And if we still want to have that a few years down the road, we need to protect places like Guyana, places like the Rupununi that still offer you that. Because it's one of the few places you can go to in the world where you still get that untouched natural experience. 